Hey, Cypher here. The movie I'm reviewing today was strangely wonderful. The Founder is a masterclass in good filmmaking for biopic storytelling. It is a tour de force of narrative intent and ambiguity. Somehow all that could be said about a movie that's just talking about the mass franchising of McDonald's. It's not epic. It's not glorifying. It doesn't even have a perfectly satisfying ending. Instead, it has a good story that actually contributes to our understanding of the world rather than hindering it. So what makes the so-called founding of McDonald's so story-worthy anyways? The chain restaurants called McDonald's today has a very strange beginning. The now iconic Golden Arches, that can be said to practically rank among star-spangled banners and crucifix-adorned churches in American symbology. The new American church. Feeding bodies and feeding souls and it ain't just open on Sundays, boys. Crosses. Flags. Arches has some indigestion when speaking of its own past, much like the other American symbols. There are three people who are claimed as founders of the chain, only two of which happen to be named McDonald. Beginning with the McDonald brothers, these two men tried to start a number of businesses before landing on their restaurant idea in 1940. It took them a little while before they turned the business from a San Bernardino hot dog stand into a fast food burger joint in 1948. It was part of a wave of new drive-ins that would come to be called fast food. They weren't the first. That honor might go to A&W in 1919 or White Castle back in the early 20s. Or maybe even the automats of the turn of the century. But the McDonald brothers were part of the post-World War II boom in automobile-centric restaurants that served food quickly. Since so many people were able to afford cars. The nation on wheels with more motorized mobility than ever dreamed of before. And the road system was beginning to shape up in a way that made those people be able to drive anywhere they wanted to. Fast food became increasingly dominant. The McDonald brothers saw this post-war boom and decided to focus on speeding up food production. It's a symphony of efficiency, not a wasted motion. They industrialized the process of making burgers like Henry Ford had with cars. They got it down to a science and managed their new business model to an immaculate shine. They began franchising in 1953, making sure that every location had a strict policy that made all the burgers the same. A year later, a man named Ray Kroc became one of those franchisees, building his first store in Des Plaines, Illinois. He was a World War I veteran turned salesman. He had sold the McDonald brothers some milkshake machines and then wanted in on the action. He started working as a franchising agent in the Midwest. That side of the business grew by leaps and bounds, and before long, Kroc wanted to escape the limitations of his contract with the McDonald brothers. Kroc had been incensed that the brothers had sold the franchising rights in his area to another company and he had to buy those rights back. Then the brothers made it difficult for him to make any changes to the restaurant, since the whole idea of the franchising was to make sure the food was the same quality everywhere. Kroc began to enfranchise others, using some conniving practices to maintain his control over them. This wasn't just contractual obligations, he also owned the land they built their franchises on. You're not in the burger business. You're in the real estate business. He used this power over new franchisees to usurp the brothers' contractual authority over him. Anything relating to McDonald's is within our purview. Let me explain something to you, Dick. You boys have full say over what goes on inside the restaurants. But outside, above, below, your authority stops at the door and at the floor. Kroc even called his private holding company McDonald's without its namesake's approval. After a few years of the tensions between the McDonald brothers and Kroc's company building, it all finally came to a head in 1961. Kroc bought the brothers out for $2.7 million. The brothers claimed to have a handshake deal with Kroc that they would retain a 1% royalty, but they never saw any payments. Kroc turned around and forgot about the brothers altogether. 
He forced them to change the name of the original restaurant, called his first restaurant in Des Plaines number one, and even started referring to himself as the founder of McDonald's. This is Ray Kroc, founder of McDonald's, a man who had a dream 23 years ago. To add insult to injury, the very next year, he introduced Ronald McDonald, a clown that carried neither of the brothers' actual name. Well, hi! Isn't that McDonald's hamburger delicious? Mom told me never to talk to strangers. Well, your mother's right as always, but I'm Ronald McDonald! Ronald you know, McDonald! The hamburger happy clown, a McDonald's driving restaurant is his favorite place in town. Man, I know we're going to be friends too, because I like to do everything boys and girls like to do. Bad touch, bad touch, stranger danger. The original restaurant was allowed to continue functioning, but another McDonald's restaurant was opened just down the road and eventually outcompeted the original location. The last franchised location with no ties to Crocs company closed down in 1994. Ultimately, McDonald's became a corporate giant by making sure its burgers were the same at every franchise, and the overarching control that monopolized power throughout the franchise. Purple. Very, very powerful. The restaurants are just as chained to each other as their past is. Despite the so-called founder conspiring to rid McDonald's of its past, as is the nature of conspiracies, he failed to silence people. This is no way to escape the kind of scrutiny that comes with such a big name. So of course there has been reams of material produced on the early years of the chain. Heck, there are several documentaries. The corporation has actually been using the story themselves. Their own corporate historians have written on their scandalous beginnings. Ray had the vision. He saw McDonald Brothers restaurant in San Bernardino, California. And he sold paper cups and multi-mixers. And going into those kitchens and restaurants, he knew how that concept could translate throughout the United States and eventually globally. Ray had the vision. There is no lack of contravening narratives and evidence. Even the documentaries seem to be quite accurate on this subject. This film had a lot to go off of and I believe they paid close attention to the scholarship on this. The screenplay was written with only two biographies in mind, but there is so much more shown that indicates someone was doing more research than that. But the production is where this gets a little more interesting, because this was unauthorized. That means the actual McDonald's Corporation does not sanction this film, nor had anything to do with the making of it. Much like The Social Network did a few years back, this film is totally relying on fair use to avoid getting in trouble because of intellectual property rights. So let's see if the film that relies on fair use flags this episode that relies on fair use to critique it. Because of their reliance on fair use, you would think that they'd try to fictionalize this a bit to be on the safe side. Not quote anyone directly, and maybe alter logos and advertising materials. But they were just as bold as Ray Kroc himself in appropriating the name of McDonald's. And I'm loving it. This is seriously amazing work. Since it is unsanctioned, it manages to be accurate and thereby entertaining in a way that few filmmakers are imaginative and competent enough to do. The film is about Ray Kroc, but it is more about the founding of McDonald's as a chain. So instead of doing a cradle to grave story, it begins with 1954 and ends in 1961, really only talking about the restaurant chain as a whole. As such, there is a lot of procedural elements in this movie that could easily have been made boring or inaccurate. You know, like a lot of exposition or mixing time frames or overstating things for dramatic effect. Instead, it relies on exposition dumps as character building events through dialogue, and procedural explanations as montages. There's this great scene near the beginning where the protagonist is meeting with the McDonald characters for dinner. They go on to explain their creation of the restaurant, but it is done with them bouncing off of each other in dialogue. There's quips and jests, and it all goes to build the way these characters interact with each other for the rest of the movie, while also giving us the best explanation possible of the whole creation of McDonald's. Best of all, it's accurate. 
They let the drama build from reality, rather than try to paste some weak facade of fictionalized narrative over reality. At points, I honestly had trouble telling if they were using actual footage or audio, and the whole thing keeps you interested. The same could be said for the whole film. If there's explaining to be done, it cuts to a montage, or weaves into character-building dialogue. Every time the music queued up for montage, I found myself getting more interested. In a movie about a burger joint, of all things. This could have easily been boring. There's no action, no suspense, but there doesn't need to be. The montages are frenetic enough to be engaging, and the narrative is accurate. They let history do the storytelling for them. It is just about dealing with these characters, and that is ultimately really good filmmaking. So why didn't you just steal it? Just grab your ideas and run off, start my own business using all those ideas of yours. What a fail. Enlighten me. It's not just the system, Dick. It's the name. McDonald's. It's got a nice sounding name. There is only a couple of things worth pointing out, and they aren't bad at all. The movie makes it sound like the McDonald brothers were the inventors of fast food. It shows that there were other drive-in places before them, but it makes it seem like a number of ideas came from the brothers. They were not the first to use disposable packaging, have people walk up to the window. What else don't we need? Turns out quite a lot. Car hops. Walk up to a window, get your food yourself. Dishes? All paper packaging, disposable, cigarettes. Or use a manufacturing line style of food prep. They were one of many, and it is quite arguable as to who did what first, or combined the total. What made McDonald's a popular chain was simply that Ray Kroc managed to franchise faster than other fast food chains. By making it seem like they were the first, the McDonald brothers seem like even greater victims. But all that is only made through implication, and never directly stated. At the end, there is a repetition of the whole handshake deal for a 1% royalty that supposedly happened, but just as the movie states, the McDonald brothers were never able to prove it. It is important to note that, since the whole thing was denied by Croc. The movie obviously believes the brothers in that regard, but this is a case of disputed history. And that's about it. Nothing affects the narrative, so there's nothing wrong. Plus, you get to see an amazingly well-crafted characterization of the beginning of McDonald's. Ray Kroc probably wouldn't have liked the depiction, but disliking something and being incorrect are two very different things. If you haven't seen this movie, you should, even if it seems mundane. Seriously, it was surprisingly fun and a breath of fresh air, simply because they let history itself tell the story. Since they narrowed the story down enough to omit the cradle-to-grave crap that most biopics do, or biopics, however you want to say it, this biopic is one of the few movies I can praise unvarnished. Unvarnished.